Good morning. I'm here to record the Bible study for this Sunday uh, as we continue our, our look at Genesis. It's going to be done by me, by myself, so it won't have the prowess that uh, comes when Jonathan is in here helping me, but Jonathan is off at a family funeral this week, and so we pray that uh, God would be with him. I think it's his uncle who passed away. Um, also, uh, you know, we, we're doing the Bible study still this way and recording it rather than live stream. It'll, it'll broadcast, it'll go live on Sunday, but um, it's recorded because the time between the services doesn't quite give us enough time for him to make sure that everything is, uh, at least not yet anyway, that everything is set up right and that we're ready to work with the live stream. And so uh, here's, here's this week's Bible study, and uh, we're in Genesis chapter 40. And I pray God bless our time together. Let's, let's ask his blessing. Father, as we enter into the study of your word today, let your spirit enter into us and into your word. And as we come into your presence, Lord, let your spirit open that word to our hearts and our hearts, our minds, to your word. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we're, we're in, the, in a COVID world and things keep changing, but it, I have to tell you, it's so good to see people on Sunday morning. It's so good to celebrate and rejoice over God's goodness and to be with God's people. But it's also, for those of you who are still joining us online, let, let, I want you to know we miss you, but we understand. And we rejoice that we have this technology. I don't know what they did in, in uh, after World War I when they had the uh, Spanish flu, the flu epidemic. They killed millions I think 50 million around the world. I don't know what they did because they shut down the churches. They didn't have technology. This is this is not new what we're doing right now, but it, except that we have all this technology. And what a great blessing from God it is, and and how good it is to see you all on Sunday morning. Well, we we finished last week with the the story of of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, but just kind of to recap. For you, remember that one of the things I've shared with you is that the, the character of Joseph, the person of Joseph in Genesis, is a foreshadow, a type, a prophetic um, picturing of Jesus in the events of Joseph's life. And so as we look at Joseph, um, we, uh, we see Jesus in so many ways. I mean, Joseph is, is, is his father's favorite son, and Jesus is God's only begotten son. Others are jealous of Joseph. His brothers are jealous of him. The world, the, the Jewish people, the, the leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, they're, they're jealous of Jesus and plot to put him to death. And, and so you see a lot of parallels between, um, between Joseph and Jesus. Last week, we saw in action the integrity of Joseph when faced with temptation and uh, you, you, he, he chose the reason if you remember correctly for, for clinging to his integrity and saying no to temptation was because of his faith in his father because of how his works and life would reflect on his heavenly father and how could he betray him by um, not trusting him and giving into that temptation with Potiphar's wife and, and you know we see the same parallel in Jesus who is tempted in every way as we are and yet who said you shall not tempt the Lord your God and and who said you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve so in the temptation of Joseph we see a foreshadowing of the temptation of Jesus in the in the refusal to yield we see the the refusal to yield on Jesus, that he was, like we said, tempted in every way as we are, and yet was without sin. That's in Hebrews 4. And that Jesus, that's what makes Jesus the perfect Savior. That he's like us in every way except without sin. That he said no to temptation. And so we come to him who understands our struggles, but also has the power to overcome because he overcame in the face of temptation. Um... Joseph uh, passed the test, and what happens? He ends up in prison. You know, being faithful to God in this world doesn't always lead to 
great outcomes in this world. Sometimes it leads to um, disaster. Sometimes it leads to um, getting in trouble because the world sees your life and your walk with God as a witness against them. And that's certainly the same thing that happened to Jesus. He said no to temptation to live the perfect life. And what did they do? They arrested him. They lied about him. They crowned him with thorns. They whipped him. They beat him. They nailed him to a tree. Yeah, you see the life of Jesus, right, foreshadowed in the life of Joseph. And so we're in, we're in chapter 40 as we begin today, and this is where we really get into the whole thing. Dreams are a big part of Joseph's story, and here we get into it again in Joseph, in Genesis chapter 40, verse 1. He says, sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against the Lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. And they continued for some time in his custody. Now, I want you to think about the fact that it's the cupbearer and the baker. I, I don't know that there's a connection, but I think there is some connection. The baker is the baker of bread. The cup is the is the bearer of wine, bread and wine, body and blood, communion, the cup bearer and the baker. The other thing I want you to notice is that there's, there's two of them. And just, and remember also, and I, I don't know if I'm drawing straws here or not, but I want you to think about the fact Jesus is crucified with two men. Two men who are criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And here Joseph is in prison with these two men that are in trouble with the Pharaoh, the king, the Caesar of Egypt, if you would. Now, folks, the, the, you know, the, the other part of this story is that I think the, the captain of the guard knows that sometimes Pharaoh gets upset and people get thrown into prison so until Pharaoh makes up his mind about what to do with them, he's going to take care of them. And so, again, we see the trustworthiness of Joseph coming through in that he's appointed to care for and serve the cupbearer and the baker of Pharaoh. That he's given the task of, of watching out over them because I think that the captain of the guard wants to make sure they're taken care of until he knows what Pharaoh's going to do with these guys in case they should get back in their favor, in Pharaoh's favor, that he not get in trouble for mistreating them. But also, I think maybe he's, he's, he's uh, hedging his bets and, and not wanting to be responsible. Pharaoh wanted them mistreated, so he, he puts Joseph, somebody he trusts, in charge of them to serve them so that he has, you know, kind of plausible deniability on whatever happens, I think. You know, uh, um, he can't be blamed. It's, it's Joseph's fault if Pharaoh isn't happy with the way that they're treated. Well, then it continues on in verse 5. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who, confined, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. And so he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house. Notice he's called Pharaoh's officers, so they're, they, you know, they aren't they lost their place yet. Why, is your fate, why are your faces downcast today? So they're obviously troubled. And you know, I don't know about you, but I, I don't hide things well. If I'm upset, if I'm worried, if I'm fearful, my face shows it. And apparently, apparently that's what's happening here. Their face um, shows it. Why are you so downcast today? And they said to him, we've had dreams. And there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. It tells you a lot about Joseph, doesn't it? 
I don't have the answers. He's, he's not saying, I have the answer for you. He's saying, my God has. Let me take it to him. Let, tell me about it, and let's see what the Lord says. Well, we have had, where am I here? Verse, verse, um, sorry, verse 9. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to them, In my dream... There was a vine before me, and the vine, and in the, on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you. And please do not do the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. Well, that's quite a story that the cupbearer takes. And, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. If you think back to the words that are there at the beginning, you sh that he says, you will be restored. Isn't that the meaning of what our Lord says? Isn't, and if you think about these two, these two guys, the cupbearer and the, and the baker, if you think about them in terms of the thief on the cross, and the one thief, Jesus ministers to them both. Jesus is there, but the one thief rails against him and wants nothing to do with him. There's, there's no repentance. And we're going to talk about the baker in a moment. And on the other hand, there's the thief who repents and says, Lord, remember me. Now, now here the, Joseph says to, to the cupbearer, remember me. And we're going to see that the cupbearer doesn't remember him. Sometimes we fail in that, don't we? We fail to remember those who have helped us and so forth. But you know what? God doesn't forget Joseph, and we're going to come back to that. He says, he says uh, isn't, it, isn't this, when it says, you will be restored, isn't this what Jesus holds out to us? See, our, our right relationship with God is to be his servant, to serve before him. You know, there's a passage in Philippians chapter 2 where it says, Jesus made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, comma, being made in the likeness of man, that, that the very essence of what it means to be human is to be a servant. You know, we often, we often talk as if sin is the essence of what it means to be human, but that's not the case. Sin is of the essence of being a fallen human being a descendant of Adam and Eve. But Jesus is fully human, but he's, ha he's, he's without sin. So the essence of being a human as created by God is not to be a sinner, it is to be a servant. Being made in the... He made him in the son became... Uh, Jesus became a servant, being made in the likeness of men. To be in the likeness of man is to be a servant. And so when it says, when he says, Joseph says, you're going to be restored to Pharaoh. You're going to become his servant again. And won't that be wonderful? And see, that's something we need to understand about us. To be God's servant is what we were created to be. And only in that relationship with God as his servants, who serve him by caring for the creation and looking out after one another, only as servants are we happy. It's when we reach for not being servants, when we try to be master, that we make ourselves miserable. We try to have control. How much fun do you have trying to be in control? How much control do you have over other people? How frustrating does it get for me? You know, I, I always want to be able to please everyone. Well, you know, when I'm trying to make everybody happy with me, I'm trying to be master over them. It doesn't work. And when I do that, I make myself miserable. You see, I can't do God's job. I wasn't meant to be master. I was meant to be servant, and so are you. 
And so when he says he's going to restore us, he's going to restore us to a right relationship, a relationship of service to God. He also says, think on me. Isn't that amazing? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. You and I read that word remember, and I, I, uh, I think of, first of all, I think of Noah and, and the ark. And it says the Lord remembered Noah when he'd been on the water for 150 days. But you know what else I think? I think of, of my mom. Because she had Alzheimer's. And she forgot. She didn't know who I was, and even before that, she didn't know who my sisters were the last time she saw them when she was alive. She forgot everything, but I'll never forget a day when I was sitting with my mom, visiting her in, in, the, in the home where she lived, and we said the Lord's Prayer, and my mom, I didn't close my eyes, I watched her, my mom said it with me. She didn't remember anything, but she remembered that. That when everything else was stripped away, when all of life had stripped her possessions and her husband and her memory away and her health was being stripped away, what remained? God and her faith in God. And what that said to me is, is the Lord remembered my mom. God remembers you. Jesus bears in his hands the marks for the nails. And in his side, the place where the sword was driven through. And he looks at them and he remembers us. I love it. It's in the, in the book of Isaiah. Can a mother forget the child she has born? Well, of course not. Well, even if she should forget, I will never forget you, says the Lord. See, I have engraved you. In the palm of my hand. God remembers and he never forgets. And so when we pray, think on me, he remembers. And folks, you know, the Lord doesn't want us to forget him any more than Joseph wanted that cupbearer to forget him. So what did he do? He took bread and when he gave thanks, he gave it and saying, take eat. This is my body. And he took the cup, and when he gave him thanks, he gave it and saying, Drink ye all of this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. You know, Joseph wanted the, bake, the cup bearer to remember him so that Joseph could get out of prison. Jesus wants us to remember him, and that's why he gives us the sacrament, so that we can be freed from our prison so that we can know that God loves us and forgives us so that we can know that Jesus can be remember him and remember that the reason his body and blood are given for us here in this bread and wine of holy communion is because he gave his life to pay the price for our sin to redeem us and bring us back to God and so Joseph says to the capera remember me and Jesus gives us the bread and wine, the cup and the bread so that we'll remember him and all he's done for us. What a great, what a great uh, uh, table that is um, that, uh, that God gives us where he calls us into holy communion. You know the word communion means fellowship into a holy, intimate relationship with him wow and we in a sense when we come to communion we put the cup in his hands and then he shares with us the contents wow that's so great chapter 40 verse 16 when the bake, chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable he said to joseph i also had a dream there were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation. The, the three baskets are three days. In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds 
eat the flesh from you. Wow. Not so good a, a dream. The first guy dreams of a cup. The second guy dreams of um, bread. The first guy is going to be restored. The second guy like the other thief, does not repent. And, and that's, I think, I think we need to, what's the difference here between these two? I think it had to have been repentance and faith. And that's what it is for us. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and that's where um, St. Paul talks about eating and drinking the body and blood of the Lord in an unworthy manner. I want you to, to hear this again in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if I can get it open there. Um, and hear what he says. Remember that there were some problems with the celebration of communion in, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians. And Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. And one of the many problems he addresses in the, the letter to Corinth. And if you read the first Corinthians, uh, the first epistle to the Corinthians, it really covers one problem after another, doesn't it, that, that uh, um, is going on with the congregation in Corinth. Well, in chapter 11, he gets to the whole issue of how they're celebrating the Lord's Supper. He says, uh, Paul writes, starting in verse, uh, and I'm sorry I have to take off my glasses, but I'm having problems with small print, and I'm waiting on getting new glasses. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat or drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? I will not. So the Lord's Supper, instead of being this holy communion, this holy unity, was divisive. And they, they celebrated in Corinth, they celebrated as part of a, a kind of a potluck meal. They called it a love feast. But the problem was the rich were getting off early and getting there, and they were eating all the food and getting drunk on the wine. And then the poor came, and there was no food for them, and the wine was gone. And so it was very made, very obvious who the haves and have-nots were in the congregation. It was very divisive. And Paul says, that's not the purpose of the Lord's Supper. What you're celebrating is not the Lord's Supper. He goes on, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until you come. You know, when I teach um, people about communion, and I teach um, the young boys and girls who are getting ready to take their first communion, I, I often have them look at the four different places in the scripture where the words of institution, like here, are recorded. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and here in 1 Corinthians 11. And I have them tell me what's different in each version. Because, because there's, there's four different men writing for four different purposes to four different audiences from four different angles. And so they, they each related a little bit differently. Not contradictory, but a little bit different detail. And so I have them list off those differences as we read through them. And then, and then I ask, okay, what remains the same? It's basically this, that Jesus says, this is my body. And this is the new covenant in my blood. That remains the same. You know, I say it's sort of like the Holy Spirit's way of putting something in bold print so that we'll catch that that's at the heart of the sacrament. And see, folks, the, the, uh, the sacrament, at the heart of it is, is the bread is the body of Christ, the wine is the blood of Christ. If you're going to say nothing else about the sacrament, you have to say that. No matter what else each of those writers was trying to say, they had to say that because that's the sacrament. That in the bread, in, with, and under the bread, Jesus gives us his very body for the forgiveness of our sins. That in, with, and under the wine, Jesus gives us his very blood for the forgiveness of our sins. That's what we're receiving in this sacrament. 
And then he says, uh, you, when you do this, when you celebrate this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now think about that. He who died is coming. Why? Because he's alive. And the Holy Communion testifies that. He has to be alive for us to receive his body and blood in Holy Communion. So every time we come to the Lord's table and we celebrate communion, we're saying, Jesus is alive. And here he is with us. And he who kept his promise by going to the cross and dying and rising, who shed his blood for us on the cross to keep his promises, he's going to keep his promise and he's going to come back to receive us unto himself that where he is, we might be also. Well, then Paul goes on. He says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. You can sin against the body and blood of Christ. You can eat and drink communion to your judgment. Why? When you come with an unrepentant heart. When you come in unbelief. When you fail to believe the promise that God has made here. That's why we in the Lutheran Church really believe in communing those who believe what the scriptures teach. That Christ is really, truly present in the Lord's Supper. I know not all denominations believe that. But we do. And, and so we take this very seriously. That the difference here is in repentance. You know, I, I mean, I put it to you this way. Our pastor, when we were going through confirmation, said, well, who's worthy to take the Lord's Supper? Well, the answer is the person who recognizes they're unworthy. Only the unworthy are invited. Sort of like the parable that Jesus told about the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee standing up front, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. He's like this tax collector here. I fast and I give twice and I do all these other things for you, Lord. And, and there's the tax collector in the back and he won't even lift up his head. And all he says to God is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, the difference is the Pharisee thought he was worthy. The tax collector realized he was unworthy. Which of these men, Jesus asked, went home justified? Well, the tax collector did. Because he knew he was unworthy. Who's worthy to come to the Lord's table? The, person, the humble person who recognizes he's unworthy. The person of repentance and, and faith. Who holds out his empty hands and believes that into them God places his most precious gift. Not the person who's so full of himself that he thinks God owes him whatever it is that God has to give. Now, what did all that have to do with the story of the, these two men, the cupbearer and so forth, uh, in, uh, in the um, story we're doing back here in Genesis? I think that's the difference between the cupbearer and the baker. One is repentant and the other is not. And see... We talk about objective justification. We talk about the fact that God has forgiven everybody. And, the, and God forgave both those thieves in the cross. But that's only received subjectively by faith, by me believing, by me turning from my sin and believing it. And that, the Holy Spirit works in us. And the one thief on the cross was repentant. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Faith and repentance appropriates the free gift of salvation God holds out to us in Jesus Christ. Well, back here in, in, in Genesis 40, on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of his cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and placed the cup, in, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph interpreted to them. And the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. 
Now, I'm not one who believes in coincidences, especially not in Holy Scripture, and I don't think it's coincidental that the, Joseph predicts that this will happen in three days and that it happens in three days, and in three days, one is lifted up and the other is hanged. Because what happened three days after our Lord's death? His resurrection. And how you believe or don't believe on that event, on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on those three days, makes all the difference between being lifted up and restored or damnation. It's not by accident that this is three days. It's meant, I believe, really to give us a picture of what God would do in Christ. Okay, so we go on here. Um, now down into verse 41, chapter 41, verses 1 through 8. We're going to keep going. We're going to get through two chapters today. I know you're going to think this is a, a miracle with Pastor Braun. After two years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Now, the chief cupbearer did not remember. I didn't really put that. The chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. That's the end of chapter 40. And it's two years. How discouraging for Joseph. How easy to think he'd been forgotten. And not only the cupbearer had forgotten him, but that God had forgotten him and let him languish there for a reason, a season. But God had his reasons. And behold, there came up, and Pharaoh had a dream, and he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows, and Pharaoh awoke. And then he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold... Seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stack. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears. And Pharaoh awoke. And behold, it was a dream. So in the morning, his men, his spirit, sorry, his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them for him. So Pharaoh tells his dreams, and he has these dreams, and he's very troubled um, because no one can interpret them. You know, all these wise men and these magicians, you know, but they were, they were magi, astronomers probably. At least that's what they would have been in the country of uh, Babylon. And you know, I, I, I want you to notice something, that in Matthew 2, the magi are called wise men in a lot of translations. Folks, I want you to be careful of that, because that translation, that interpretation of them as wise men doesn't come till the period of the Enlightenment. In Matthew's Gospel, the Magi are fools because they're, they worship and follow stars. It's not the star so much that leads them to Jesus. What do they ultimately have to use to get to Jesus? It's the Word of God. Okay. And because these stargazers, these astrologers are foolish. They're practicing arts they're not supposed to practice. And they're shown to be fools here because they can't interpret the dream. And folks, don't be, don't be reading horoscopes. Don't be buying into that stuff. Don't get into astrology. It's all arts of the devil, whatever it is. It has no place with us. Well, verse 9, then the cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. You can always say, ah, I remember. I can't believe I forgot. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants, and put me and the chief baker in custody, right, in the house of the captain of the guard. We dreamed on the same night, he and I having 
each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant to the captain of the guard. And when we told him, he interpreted our dream to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. And I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. Right? Well, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And, when, and so it, whatever he's staying in, at this point, the prison, he may have risen in the guard, but it's a pit. Okay, It's not a good place. They quickly brought him out of the pit, and when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came be, in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret, interpret it. I have heard it said that you, when you hear a dream, can interpret it. And I love Joseph. He doesn't say, oh, yeah, I'm great at that stuff. You, you can count on me, Pharaoh. No, that's not what he says. He says, it's not me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. You know, um, It's, it's so much, right? Not about you and me. Our, our role is to let our light shine before men and give glory to our Father in heaven so they'll believe in him. And Joseph's role is, is to point to God, and that's what he does for Pharaoh. He points him to God. It's not me. It's God. Now, so I'm going to be a false humility. I've told you the story about standing there and somebody was giving me a compliment. And it's Karen Goff, uh, Dr. Karen Goff at my first, last parish here in, in Flower Mound. And, and I said, oh, no, no, it's God and everything. And she looked at me and said, Pastor, quit being falsely humble. I says, if I tell you something nice about you, I mean it. I don't say it lightly. So just say thank you and go on. So no false humility. But that our lives would bring glory to God and would testify, wow, God is good and God can do this. That our lives would reflect that to people. God can handle this. And I, I keep having to remember that, especially with things changing and everybody having a different opinion about COVID-19 and how we should or shouldn't reopen. And me knowing that, hey, I, I'm trying to get the right answer, but I don't always get the right answer. And, and needing to say, Lord, I got to trust you. And trust that you have this. And that you'll direct it in the right way if I get it wrong. If we get it wrong. That you're the God who's great. I'm, I'm, I'm fallible and I make mistakes. The same is true for you. So Joseph says, it's, it's, not, it's not me. It's God. So we pick up at verse 17. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed on the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them. For they were still ugly as at the beginning. And then I woke, and I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good, and seven ears withered and thin and blighted by the east wind sprouted up after them, and, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Well, and Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. Both mean the same thing. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good years are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty years blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. 
There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown to the land by reason of the famine that will, be, that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God. And God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man. So that's in verse 32. Right? Yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there for a second. Just kind of go on. It's going to be a difficult, severe time. Now, notice, notice the number is seven. It's a number for God, number of completeness, and it can be seven. The four is the number of, of you know, uh, four plus three is seven. You begin to see where the, the numbers begin to take on their meaning in Scripture that they get later get used in the book of Revelation. There'll be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine until God's work in each place is complete until God's promise is complete. Well, verse 32, he goes on. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God and God will surely bring it about. Right? Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to a point overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the, the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a re reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish. Through famine. So there we are in verse. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having so much trouble seeing this. And so then he goes on. And he says, "This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants." And Pharaoh said to his servants, "Can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God?" Right? Wow! What a great compliment to Joseph, wasn't it? You know. How do you know that someone has is a spiritual man? If they can interpret dreams or do miracles? Well, there are objective signs that God has given you his spirit. He promised. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. You were baptized. God gave you his spirit. But there are also subjective signs, right? there: wisdom. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, kindness, and the like. Integrity. See a person of prayer, honesty. Joseph bears those signs. And, and apparently, Pharaoh recognizes it, right? And Pharaoh says, who is like this man who, who, who has the Spirit of God within him? You know, how do you know if somebody has the Spirit of God? Well, one thing is humility. See that in, in, in Joseph? A person of the word and prayer, of faith, trusting in God, of repentance. You know, I think that's maybe one of the biggest signs. Somebody who, who is repentant and sorrow, sorry over their sins. Not, not for Jesus, but for you and me. Who knows? I'm just a humble sinner. It's God who does the great things in and through us. I think you look for repentance. You look for humility. You look for faith. You look, see, are they in the word? There are outward signs. I think the other ones are inward 
Is the outward sign of God, baptism that we talked about? What are you looking for? When you look for a spiritual man, somebody whose heart belongs to God, is somebody whose heart and life is sold out for God. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean they're without sin. You're looking for that person, there's only been one of them, that's Jesus. But we're reflections, as in a mere dimly, but reflections. Of repent, repentant, humble faith and integrity. Well, let's go on and we're going to finish this chapter, starting at verse 39. Yeah, we're going to finish two chapters. I know you're, you're thinking this is amazing, uh, right? Well, I don't know how amazing it is, but anyway, verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, and there is none as discerning and wise as you are, you shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne shall I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land. And then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it, on Joseph's hand, put it in Joseph's hand. And clothed him in garments of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot, and they called out to him, Bow the knee! And then he set him over all the land of Egypt. Think about that. Think about Philippians 2. Jesus made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even death on a cross. Therefore, now think about this, therefore God has highly exalted him and placed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you see Jesus being foreshadowed in Joseph? That Joseph is elevated to the right hand of Pharaoh. That Joseph is made a steward in Pharaoh's house. Given charge over everything of Pharaoh. Answerable only to Pharaoh. And Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man, is now exalted to the right hand of God. He's placed over all things his head for the church. That's Ephesians chapter 1, isn't it? So that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even as the knees bow here to Joseph. Right? Joseph is a shadow of Christ. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zeph Zevenath Paneah. And he gave him in marriage to Azanath the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And so Joseph went, o went over the land of Egypt. Now, I want you to think about something, because we're going to come back to this. Just wanna, I just want to remind you, remember Joseph's dreams. When Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, there's no way those dreams could have been true. But yes, there was. This is God's promise. Be paying attention to that because we're going to see all of Joseph's dreams, in spite of the impossibility of it, come true. And not as they thought, as arrogance or lording it over his, as his, his brothers and his father, but to save his father and brother. God had a plan. And even when you don't see it and it seems like, what's going on here? God has a plan. You can trust him. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out in the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. And during the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly. And he gathered up all the food of those seven years, which, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and put the food in the cities. And he put in every city the food from the fields around it. And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it cannot be measured. Before, before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, Azanath, the daughter of, of Potiphar, priest of On, bore them to her. Joseph 
called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, which means forgetting. Remember that. And in the first one, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful. Ephraim means fruitful. God has made me fruitful in all my affliction. Folks, first comes forgetting the past, and then comes the fruitful future. How many of you, I find myself held back by my past. I find myself hanging on to, to worries and fears and failures. And hanging on to those things, or it hurts and habits and addictions, whatever they are, they, they become a prison. They keep you from moving forward. I love St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, where he says, you know, if I... I had all sorts of things I could brag about. Hebrew of Hebrews. As the law of Pharisee, as the legalistic righteousness without fault, as the zeal persecuting the church. But he says, whatever it was to my gain, I count but loss. It's now rubbish to me. Why, that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through faith in Christ. All that other stuff that he was so proud of, that he hung on to as his pride, was actually holding him back from knowing God. And so he says later in the chapter, he says, therefore, forgetting what lies behind, I press on towards what lies ahead. I press on towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus to lay hold of what God has in store for me. But to do that, to have that fruit, I have with God's help to let go, to forgive the past, to forgive yourself. It's one of the toughest things to do, isn't it? But you know, when you don't forgive yourself, you're not only hurting you, you're hurting other people. You're robbing them of what God wants to give them through you. You want to know fruitful, joyful years? Leave the past behind. Christ paid the price for it. It was nailed to the cross, even as any future sin has already been nailed to the cross. It's covered in his blood. The bill is paid in full. You don't need to keep hanging on to it. You know, sometimes I have trouble throwing out things. I love the fact that after, what, seven, ten years, you can throw out your tax stuff. It's a great feeling. Throw it out. Leave it behind. Don't let it imprison you. Manasseh. Forget it, Ephraim, so that God can make you fruitful, so you can be free to live for him. He goes on and he says, Then the seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come. As Joseph had said, there was famine in the lands, but in the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished and people cried out to Pharaoh for bread, Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, what he says to you do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all, moreover, all the earth came to Egypt, to Joseph, to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. So I want you to think as we close today about those words. Whatever Joseph says, do. You know, those are the last words that Mary speaks as well. The wedding in Cana, when Jesus says, woman, why should I have, you know, she comes to him because they run out of wine, and he says, woman, what do I have to do with you? It's not my hour. You know what she said to them? She said, whatever he tells, she says this to the servants with the, who will eventually bring the, the jars of wine, water. Whatever he says to you, do. Folks, Joseph is a picture of Jesus. And Mary's advice is great advice. Whatever Jesus says to you, do. Let go of the past. Confess. Come clean. Be forgiven. Humble yourself before the Lord. Do what he says. And in due time, he may lift you up. Whatever he says to you, 
do it. Great advice. Let's pray. Father, give us that kind of faith that we would trust your word and that whatever you would say to us, we would do. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.